fixators <coughs> and then probably we can take some uh, questions okay we are, we are not talking about the elizara directly but some of these principles also apply to the fixator that we are going to talk about so we are talk what we want actually in terms of biomechanics is um, optimal stability when i was when i was um, a resident that time at the end of surgery we would say ah rigid rigid fixation today rigid is a bad word today what you want is stable fixation you don't want a rigid fixation so how you ensure uh, optimal stability while at the same time remaining convenient for the patient just putting on a huge number of rings and a huge number of wires like this does not necessarily mean that it is a um, stable this is probably too stable uh, a fixation so there you have to look at your fixator as well as issues of internal um, stability so stability is not the same as um, rigidity you don't want a rigid frame so the the a good fixator has a certain amount of instability and that instability ideally should be in the axial plane right because you know that axial micro motion uh, induces bone formation all the other kinds of motion whether it is shear whether it is bending or whether it is torsion right shear is side to side movement of two fragments um torsion is rotational movement of the fraction uh, frag fragments and bending obviously you know so all of those movements are not good for healing axial micro motion is good for healing and today we talk about this stability um, spectrum which goes from unstable to rigid in the days of um, ao i mean today are still this is still the days of ao but i am talking of the days of rigid fixation where we talked of compression plating we were at the rigid end of the spectrum where seeing callus was not a good thing you put in an interfragmentary screw and hoped for primary osteonal healing nobody talks of that anymore today we are putting in nails we are putting in various kinds of flexible fixation where when you see callus that's a good thing because that's biomechanically also good so <clears throat> we are somewhere towards the secondary union side of things and not towards the primary union you don't want to be too much on this side also because then that leads to hypertrophic non unions with rigid systems you either get a delayed union or even um, stress shielding so what are the issues related to stability in a <coughs> uniplanar fixator um, <clears throat> we can look at if if for example if the fixator was in the uh, plane of the screen you can look at the stability issues in the plane of the fixator you can look at the stability issues um, perpendicular to the plane of the fixator and we look at both of that so in the plane of the fixator there is always something known as a cantilever um, effect all right however uh, strong or thick your fixator is to a lesser or a larger extent there will be a, a cantilever if you if you are using a umex kind of fixator for example with thinner wires there will be much more excursion of the uh, pins right and the immobile region is between that connecting rod and the pin that acts as a fixed point so whenever the distal end of the pin moves what is it going to do it's going to describe an arc around this point so all axial movement will also have a certain element of bending along with it you cannot have a pure axial movement in a unilateral fixator <laughs> now you notice the sort of color coding in that the the good movements are written in green and the bad movements are written in red so 
to reduce this bend, uh, bending movements, what was done was they used bilateral uh, fixators. That is one pin going through and through with connections on either side. So this minimized the bending movements, which was a good thing. But it also minimized the axial micro motion, which was not a good thing. Now, if you look at stability 90 degrees to the plane, you will find that the bending movement is much less. But if if the pins are like this, they can there can still be a little bit of shear in between them. But the bending movement, because the pins are like this, this movement becomes minimal. So what you will notice is in the plane of the fixator and perpendicular to the plane of the fixator, the movements are sort of cancelling out each other. Here bending movement is less, there there is bending movement, here there is no shear, here there is shear. Right? So what came about earlier was to counter the stability on one, uh, the instability in one situation, you put in a fixator 90 degrees to each other. So each fixator cancels out the instability in the other plane. But what that led to was a very, very stiff kind of construct and gave fixators their bad name as non-union machines. <clears throat> they needed complicated, gradual, uh, destabilization. The other variables which you should know, um, especially when you are using these for um, trauma, <coughs> is the distance from the bone. When your connecting rod is a larger distance, you have more of the shan spin exposed to these cantilever forces. The longer the shan spin, the more it can uh, move the thickness of your pin. On this fixator, uh, when, 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 we, when we talk about the instrumentation, you will see we are using 6 mm pins. Right? Uh, if you are using 4.5 mm pins, in the tibia maybe they are okay, but for long term retention, thicker pins are probably uh, better. Then the thickness of the connecting rod. There are two kinds of standard fixators available in the market. One is what's known as a con uh, SQLab type and one is the AO type. The SQLab types are 8 mm and the AO types are, I think, 11 mm. So the thicker the connecting rod, the better is your um, stability. That's why the SQLab always you will have to use two. You can't use just one. Um, second is the mirror image of the rods, the connecting rods on either side. And finally is uh, fracture gap or internal stability. Again, when we were residents, we were always taught to try and maintain uh, length. That may not be such a uh, good idea today because in those days, lengthening was not such a uh, readily, uh, a thing which could be readily done. Today, lengthening is not a big issue. Getting union of a bad fracture is still an issue. So you can always shorten the fracture get contact internally so that you have internal stability and then do a um, lengthening later. <laughs> so how the orthofix is different from all of this is there it is axially unstable by design. There is a nut on the back which as soon as you loosen the clamps are free to move um, towards each other. But it is very stable to the uh, bending, rotation, and to shear by virtue of its size as well as um, cross section. That I'll, I'll talk to you when we um, talk about the instrumentation. The Elisera, on the other hand, um, has got this concept of an I beam where you have a tensioned wire which is anchored on both ends. So this is like a bilateral fixator, but because it's a wire, it is not rigid. It allows for some amount of movement. So with an I-beam, you will just have 
axial micro motion and there is no uh, bending. The bending stability, torsional stability and shear stability of an Elizarov is equal to if not more in most instances to standard um, fixators. So, if you want to sort of argue or if you want to ask the question which is the most stable, it is always the Elizarov. But you do not necessarily always need the most stable, you need a fixator which is stable enough. So, there are many situations where you may not need the uh, Elizarov, but in, in difficult situations where there are other sort of uh, complicating issues, then the Elizarov is biomechanically definitely um, superior. The other question is what is um, axial micro motion? Normally, what the studies have shown is probably less than 1 millimeter at maximum load, you know, 1 millimeter of maximum movement at the maximum um, load. These are all purely <laughs> <coughs> Then comes the issue of um, shan screws or half pins. The ones that we are using are uh, 6 mm in diameter, they are a tapering design which tapers to about 5 mm in the front and at the back it is 6. And this increased diameter, you know how when you do a nailing everybody talks about you got to use at least a 10, 10 size nail or if you can manage it 11 size. Why? Because but from a 9 to a 10 it is not only an increase it is not an arithmetical increase of 1 millimeter, it is a geometrical increase in relation to the uh, diameter, the strength of it. So, when you are using a 6 mm compared to a 4.5 or a 5, it is not only the increase of 1 millimeter, it is a geometric increase in the strength of that uh, pin. And especially when you are talking of, of um, you know, this kind of work, uh, the reconstructive kind of work, where we are saying that the fixators or the pins are going to be in for a long time. You know, you are not talking of fixators for two weeks and three weeks. You are talking of fixators for three, four months at a minimum. Um, <clears throat> this is, of course, this is a unilateral frame, but even in an Elizarov, if you use a hybrid frame, uh, as I said, biomechanically it is less stable. But if you look at the clinical results, um, treating a certain kind of fracture or doing lengthening with a hybrid frame and doing lengthening with an all wire frame, there is really not much of uh, difference in terms of how long the regenerate takes to solidify. Same thing with a, a unilateral kind of frame. So that has got no real um, issues. With this kind of shan spin, uh, I always advocate pre-drilling and the reason for that is twofold. One, uh, anything which serves two purposes, you know, is always a compromise. When, when you have a, a screw which is supposed to drill also and hold, it does not do both of them as well. So, one of the biggest issues relating to long term retention of pins is thermal necrosis and consequent loosening. So, if you have a good sharp drill bit which does the drilling and then use the shan screw, that is always better for long term retention. And finally, <coughs> um, <coughs> as I said, thermal necrosis you have to avoid. If there is porosis, there is not much that you can do, uh, do about it you have to sort of use fixator systems which will allow to hold for that. But as a matter of principle, when you are holding on to a particular bone, this you already learned with when you are using your AO uh, fixators also, that you want to hold as wide a span of bone as possible. So, if you have a fracture in the middle of the shaft, you want one set of pins or one pin as close to the fracture, another pin as far away from the fracture as uh, possible. That holds true for an Elizarov, that holds true for a uh, this thing also.
Okay.